All right, uh, I'm going to get started. We only have uh, 20 minutes of lecture and then we'll have our anticipated quiz. Um, yeah, so just uh, some logistics before we start class. No cheat sheets. So this is just you, your calculator, pen or pencil, and that's it. Um, no phones, no iPads, no whatever. Uh, if that, if it, if you think if you use a cheat sheet, you will get a zero, and you might get uh, basically uh, reported to academic integrity. So please do not do that. Last semester, I had to do that to someone. <clears throat> Yeah, anyway, um, and it turned into a whole debacle because apparently I I uh I traumatized them because I uh took their test in front of everyone and then I had to we had to go and have this conversation with the chair and then the chair was just like Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh I do not want to go through that. I also do not want to give you a zero because, I, I mean, in a quiz, maybe you can get away with it. But in an exam, if you get a zero, that's basically you're not going to pass this class. Um, it is what it is. With a quiz, I mean, we drop one. So, yeah, you might get through your semester. But just, like I said, 50% attendance. If you plan to pass this class, I designed this quiz so that you will get a 75. So, I mean, I, I expect C students to be able to very easily do the first three questions. And then the last question is more like B and A. Um, and mostly because this, and mostly I designed the quiz like that because this is an assessment for me to know where the class is. And also an assessment for you with very low stakes so that you can study more so that when the exam comes, you do better and then more people pass and then everybody's happy and whatever. Um, also, there's a, there's an aspect to this that reality is, or at least this is my experience when I was an undergrad, that when you get a question wrong in an exam, you don't forget it. So if you get it wrong in this quiz, you don't lose a lot of points, but then when it comes around in exam time where it really does count, hopefully you'll get it right. Uh, yeah, anyway. All right, so let's get started. So last class, we went over LC circuits and we said LC circuits were basically similar to what we call RC circuit, R RLC circuits. The main distinguishing feature was that you did not have this uh, first order Term and this should actually be a mix. Um, so that's for LC circuits. Once we added the resistor, then this term here appeared, and then we were able to get a much more uh, rich form of responses. So we, from an LC circuit, we only got uh, sines and cosines as our roots of the characteristic equation. And um, we call this undamped. Uh, now, once we started looking at RLCs, we were able to get kind of different types of responses. In particular, we either got a decaying exponential, which is similar to the RLRC responses, or we got what we call critically dense, which is when we have repeated roots. And so now we have kind of an exponential and then a time times an exponential as our characteristic equation or our homogeneous solution. And we call this critically damped. And then we also had another case where we had complex roots for our characteristic equation. And in that case, we had that our homogeneous solution would be of this form, where this would be the real part of the root. And this is the imaginary part of the root. <clears throat> OK, so that's kind of what we went over last class. In last class, we looked at our series RLC. Uh, and for this particular circuit, we said that the, uh, the, the strength of the resistor would represent uh, 
what uh, regime we would be in. So basically, if we had a very high resistance, that would decay rapidly. So high R means that we would be overdamped. And then low R meant that we were underdamped. And that kind of uh, goes with the fact that if you have a very high resistance relative to the inductance and capacitance, this just behaves like a resistor circuit. And so it, it tends to just kind of uh, behave more like an RL or an RC. That being said, if, if this resistor is very weak, so if this starts to behave like a short, and then we kind of start to collapse more and more into the way a uh, LC circuit behaves, basically. So that's kind of a the general features of the RLC. And then we also looked at the solutions and uh, we got that these are what the roots look like. And again, this also kind of uh, exemplifies what I just said. So if I plug in zero here and I plug in zero here, what I get is that my root is actually one over negative one over LC, which is the two imaginary roots of our LC circuit. Now, if I were to make this really large, really large, then what we would have here is that uh, this thing would be negligible and one of our roots would be close to zero and our other root would actually be quite large too. And so again, we would be in an overdamped case. So this kind of uh, confirms our intuition based on thinking of the circuit as like either a short or an open. Um, Okay, so that's kind of uh, what we went over. Uh, here are kind of the three regimes again. And now we're gonna look at the parallel configuration. Now, just before we even go over this, would you expect this to be more overdamped or less when R increases? Yes, exactly, less. Because if R is really big, it behaves as an open. And so what you actually have is an LC circuit. So the parallel configuration actually behaves in the opposite way of the series one. Big, big R means that R is less relevant. Small R means that uh, R is very relevant. Because if you have a small R, then this is shorted effectively and you have all of the current will just want to go through the resistor and the capacitor and inductor are not even there. Um, so intuitively, what we would expect is that those roots will actually be proportional to one over R, uh, or the real, the, the real part will be proportional to one over R. But uh, of course, this is not uh, enough. So let's try to derive the equation for this circuit and see if indeed we are correct. So let's look at the voltage across the capacitor. So we can apply KCL at this node. So we have that I in sub T is equal to the, uh, the, the current going through the resistor sub T plus the current going through the inductor sub T plus the current going through the capacitor sub T. Okay, so in terms of the capacitive voltage, what is the current going through the resistor? Yeah, so it's just uh, V, C, sub T over R because the uh, resistor is connected to V, C. And then for I, L, how is that relate? How is I, L related to the voltage across the inductor? L so just uh so we have that uh we have that vl equals l d d t of i and then the fundamental theorem of calculus would say that i equals one over l the integral of v d t so one thing is that uh when you think about these expressions, you you should think of derivatives as division, 
integrals as multiplication because they're inverses of one another. So what this is really saying is that the voltage is the the is is kind of a derivative which acts like a division type of a thing. And so then that means that to invert this, all I have to do is integrate. Um, so basically we have that the inductor current is just one over L VL dt. And then this goes from negative infinity to T if you want to be correct. And then there should be a tau here and it should be the tau, sorry, not dt. Um, of course, we're going to take the derivative of everything. So it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, inconsequential of whether you get these limits right or not. Okay. And so how is IC related to the voltage? Go ahead. Oh, it's just CD, EBT, DT. Okay. CD, DT of V, C, DT. Oh, yeah. CD. Yeah. Okay, so now we have a, an equation for the for the voltage, and what do we have to do to this equation to turn it into a differential equation? Yeah, so we just take the derivative of everything, and then we're going to get that d d t of i ins of t equals um, c d d t v c sub t squared. So I just moved this one as the first term. So I just wrote this one. So now I got to add the second term, which would be this one over R D D T V C sub T plus V over L V C sub T. Um, so that's our final equation. And now we just have to find the roots of this equation to get the, the, uh, the characteristic polynomial, basically, we have to get the characteristic polynomial and find the roots to get the form of the homogeneous response. But before we do, we typically will divide everything out so that the coefficient here is one just to put it in a more standard form. So then this becomes RC and this becomes one over LC. Uh, so that's the final equation. And in the next slide, I derive what the actual roots look like. Okay, so this is the equation I wrote on my previous slide why oh. okay so in, in i i lied so in the next slide i actually multiplied by l to get it into lc l over r and then remove this l to get the coefficient here to be one so this is just that an algebraic difference so that we can get it into this form. Um, oh, and I solve for IL. Okay. Okay, we're, we're just gonna stick with IL. So pretend that I derived this equation in the previous slide. Uh, do realize that the procedure is the same. It's just that if you were asked to find IL, then you would have to write this equation in terms of IL uh, as opposed to VC. Is it clear to everyone how you would find an equation in terms of IL? Do you want me to derive it for you? Derive it. Okay, we'll derive it. Okay, so let's derive this. Uh, so the okay so we have il here and then um so il bc yeah so we could just start from our previous equation um, so we had that, uh, no, let's not do that. So we know that this is VC over R plus IL plus C, D, D, T of VC. And then um, is there a way we can relate VC to IL? 
Yeah, so we know that uh, VL is equal to VC, which is equal to L DDT of I L. And so we can just simply plug this in wherever we see a VC. And so we're going to get that this is L over R DDT of I L plus I L plus L C DDT squared of I L. So is that clear to everyone? And that's the equation on this slide, basically, except uh, okay, except I divide it by L C to get it into that form. So here I Did I do this right? So V C V L C L C squared good. Okay, cool. Yeah. No more questions? Okay, let's move on. I need to keep track of time. Okay, we have two minutes. We're gonna do this. Yeah. All right. Um so now we're here and now we just have to find the roots of this. So you plug it into your quadratic equation. So basically you convert second order derivatives to lambda squared, first order derivative to lambda, and then zero order derivative to a constant. And then you can find the two roots. Um, one thing I, I wanna keep a note here is that before we had the R in the numerator, now you can see that we have it in the denominator, uh, which is what we would have expected based on the fact that if this behaves as an open, or if R equals infinity, we would expect this to act like an LC circuit. So if R equals infinity, this will be zero, this will be zero, and it behaves like an LC. If R is really small, then uh, sorry, then this term will be really large, this term will be really large, and this LC will have very little. So it starts to behave more and more like an RC circuit, uh, except now it has two roots, but. So, so we we see that that at least that intuitively this makes sense just based on the circuit diagram. So just I derived an alternate form in terms of VC. One thing to note is that those roots will be the same for both equations because those particular roots are actually characteristic of the solution of this circuit. So that they're kind of inherent to the circuit. Um. So so basically. The homogeneous solute, the form of the homogeneous solution will be the same whether you solve for IL or uh, for VC. The constants will be different, but the form will be the same. Okay, so yeah, so as I said, um, for parallel RC, we have kind of a the similar three types of behaviors. Except now, if you're whether you're critically damped or have repeated roots, the uh, conditions are slightly different, but this is the same. Same thing if you're over damped or you have really uh, large real roots, the or dif distinct real roots, the condition is different. But now we have the same kind of type of homogeneous solution, and same thing for the under damped case. If you have a complex root. The real part of the root we typically denote by sigma. The imaginary part we denote by omega, and we typically use this kind of solution for that type of. So remember, lambda is equal to sigma plus minus omega j. So whatever you get from for lambda, the real part that will be sigma. The imaginary part will be omega. Uh, is that clear to uh, go ahead? In the overdone case, why is it on the parallel one the lambda is a constant on the VC one? Mm -hmm. I just the equation the lambda two mm -hmm. on the series slide and the uh, Huh? The lambdas are positive? Like in the, the lambda for the overdamp, like in the you have XP equals C1, the lambdas are positive, but for the series one it's negative. They're always negative. So here you can see the negative two over uh, R. I mean, not, not like there, but like in the XT equation, the, the lambdas are positive, right? 
from one ex to b to the lambda one t plus c two is possible, right? Oh, the so so lambda, right? What you would substitute into here is a negative number because resistances and capacitance are positive, and there's always a negative in front. For the series, it's a different. It's a it's it's always negative. So here I'm just saying you plug in lambda, and lambda is this thing here. But um, like when I'm trying to take some of the series one from the X T equations and go to the series one, they're gonna be negative. Oh oh oh, that's a typo. This should be positive. Yeah, that's a definitely a typo. Interesting. Okay, does this make sense? All right, uh, quiz time. So yeah, we already went over all of this. So there are a couple examples that I didn't go over during class. Um, if you want to look at a solution process for like with numbers, just you can go through those. Um, da, 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 da. So there is no front pain, so please just do not start until you are full in the code. Like you're just going to run out. Oh, you got scared. It's right down with it. Yeah, so once you're done, you see your push up at the front, and then we'll have a I think it's a 